Hello, folks. We're down the line once again from Boston tonight with political author, analyst, and historian Dr. James D. Boys. I'm Michael L. Roberts. This is the American Chronicle. It's Monday, 6th of April, 2020, and with thanks for your continuing support, we broadcast once again tonight and ride the waves of air, discussing face masks, state versus state tensions, and the political soul of Washington, framed as ever in the ever-relevant historical context in which the U.S. president's actions will come to be judged. At the helm of a painful two weeks ahead in U.S. history, I began this evening's interview by asking James to give me a sense of the feeling on the ground in Boston, in particular in relation to the availability and approval, or lack thereof, of the use of face masks. So here we are. Uh, It's at the end of what was meant to be uh, the initial two-week lockdown period here in Boston, uh, when the governor initially announced it. Uh, The uh, idea was, I think, that we were all going to be Uh, safe and sound and out again uh, by this coming Tuesday. Very clearly that is no longer the case. Uh, We've seen uh, recommendations broadly uh, from the CDC uh, as well as from the governor's office here in Boston with regard to uh, what one should be doing uh, with regard to public health, etc., etc. I think that there is a, a major challenge here in the United States, and this is something we touched upon last week, is that There is this real disconnect, I think, between uh, the directives coming from the State Department and from uh, the federal level and what's being stated at a local state level um, by uh, individual governors. We've seen, for example, uh, President Trump uh, and uh, statements from the the podium talking about uh, what one should or should not be doing, Uh, for example, uh, the use of face masks. Uh, And yet at the same uh, press conferences that uh, President Trump's advisers are suggesting that uh, the nation should start wearing face masks, the president says that he won't be doing that. At a local level here in Boston, uh, there seems to be a move towards getting people to start wearing uh, these uh, face masks. The great challenge, however, uh, frankly, is getting hold of them. Uh, Just from a personal point of view, when this was announced, I thought, well, okay, let's uh, see if we can get hold of a couple of these things. And... You go onto Amazon and, of course, there are several weeks delay for for these things. So, uh, quite frankly, it's all well and good saying, oh, you know, you need to start wearing these things. Uh, unfortunately, no one seems to be telling you where you're meant to get them, uh, how you're to secure them, uh, or what particular type you're meant to get. I've seen people walking around uh, wearing scarves, uh, some people wearing what appear to be uh, decorating masks, so um, it really is um, a, a very uh, odd time at this point. And uh, there is, frankly, a, a complete lack of uh, direction uh, at any sense, uh, either national or, uh, or local, as to exactly what the uh, ramifications are or the benefits of wearing these masks. Because in the initial days, there were suggestions that we shouldn't be doing it. Now there are suggestions that perhaps we should be doing it. Um, Really, I think at the most this point, it does appear that the government appears to be making things up as it goes along. And we will um, no doubt to, uh, have to wait and see exactly what it is uh, that transpires with regard to directives and the use of face masks in the coming days. It's so important to remember, of course, there are many, many millions of people's health at stake here. And uh, the extent to which uh, the the United States is being best served by either the media or the politicians at this point is certainly uh, a, uh, is, is one for great debate, I think. Uh, President Trump has announced he's been tested again and found not to have uh, the coronavirus. Um, but of course, then that raises severe questions as to why he had the test in the first place. Is he showing symptoms? If he's not showing symptoms, why is he taking the test? Um, why is Donald Trump suggesting that Americans should wear masks if they want to do so, but refusing to do so himself. Uh, He suggested that he really didn't like the idea of sitting behind uh, the Resolute desk in the Oval Office 
and uh, and wearing one of these things. Well, again, if this is all about appearances, uh, then quite frankly, that seems to be a rather a poor excuse not to do something. Either these masks are going to serve a purpose uh, and will protect the spread of the disease, or they won't. And if there is a challenge, I think, uh, for all Americans and indeed for all citizens around the world, it's quite frankly understanding what it is that uh, these masks are meant to do. Are they meant to prevent the spread of the disease if you have it to other people? Uh, or are they designed to prevent you from receiving um, any infection from other people who may well have it? At this point, there seems to be a total disconnect uh, between what's being said and what's being appreciated uh, and a, a lack of appreciation as to the viability of these masks. I think, quite frankly, the only people who may or may not be benefiting are the manufacturers of these, who I'm sure have seen a huge spike in demand uh, and uh, no doubt uh, are able to increase their prices as a result. One of the nicest touches we've seen so far with regards to this issue has come here in uh, the great city of Boston. Uh, just this week, we saw Robert Kraft, the owner of the uh, New England Patriots, uh, take his uh, aircraft and fly around the world to pick up uh, millions of these masks uh, from China, if I'm not mistaken, and to fly them back into uh, Logan Airport uh, from where they were then distributed to locations, uh, including here in Boston, and most notably, I think, down in New York City. Uh, it's notable that New York, of course, has a great rivalry with Boston. Uh, so I think it was a very um, important uh, touch uh, for the, uh, uh, the New England Patriots and for Robert Kraft to have done that. And that appears to have gone down very well, I think, in, uh, in New York City. Speaking of rivalry, uh, last week we discussed state versus state versus federal level uh, issues in historical context. This week, uh, there's the impression that above and beyond the trading uh, of and marking up of goods, etc., a new state versus state tension is emerging, one where states that lack social distancing measures are directly endangering citizens from other states as a result of their continued free movement across North America. Acknowledging your statement last week that Trump's powers to decree anything are limited what might he still do to set a better example and bring about a, a sense, at least, of a national standard in this regard? It's interesting, I think, to note the extent to which, and again, I'm touching upon something which we've referred to uh, several times uh, across uh, the last week or two, the extent to which uh, this current crisis in the United States has raised uh, to the fore once more the historic debate between the powers of the federal government and the state government. This has long been a dilemma here in the United States uh, as its citizens have uh, all too often struggled to identify where a priority should lie, should uh, a power lie with the states or the federal government. Uh, what we have seen emerge in the last several weeks here in the United States is again uh, another example of this as the president uh, speaks from the White House uh, with regard to what should be happening at a national level uh, and all too often appears to be very happy to engage in uh, a war of words with a series of high-profile governors across the nation, uh, not least of which, of course, uh, Governor Cuomo in New York, uh, the governor of Michigan, uh, as well as others, uh, including California. Uh, it shouldn't uh, escape anybody's attention, of course, that these are all Democrat uh, governors and he seems to be very, very happy to uh, continue his uh, war of attrition against his political opponents uh, and he's happy to use this current crisis as a result uh, to, to continue to do so. Um, the challenge, though, is that as long as there is not a national lockdown in place, which, of course, there is not at this point, uh, all stay-at-home orders have been issued by uh, most, although not all, state governors. What you're having is an ability to undermine uh, that process uh, by those states which are refusing to implement them. So you're seeing uh, the ability, to, be, for example, for citizens to move quite freely from state to state, uh, in, even around the state. So uh, there is a, a real disconnect, I think, here between the, the severity of the health crisis, which is currently being addressed in most of the states, which is coming up against this idea that it's somehow un-American to restrict the movement of peoples uh, around the nation, uh, that it is an imposition and perhaps even an unconstitutional act, quite frankly. We have seen uh, 
efforts by organizations to ensure that their rights are not uh, affected at this time period. Um, one, one of the most remarkable situations I think we find ourselves in is that at a time when most businesses uh, are in lockdown and are closed, uh, some states uh, and some organizations have been deemed essential to the public good. Uh, it might amuse listeners to understand that that includes liquor stores and gun shops. Yes, folks, it's entirely possible to go out, get drunk, buy a gun and shoot someone uh, in this time of national emergency. And the National Rifle Association is ensuring that America's rights to do just that are not being infringed at this time period. Uh, I'm, if I sound flippant, uh, it is a very serious situation. However, it is a remarkable scenario we, we find ourselves in, uh, that at this time when uh, we're seeing millions of people being laid off and becoming unemployed, uh, that liquor stores and gun shops are seeing a boom in sales as people race out to make sure uh, that they stay liquored up and uh, armed to the teeth in this time of national crisis. Uh, liquored up and armed to the teeth, quite the visual there, James, as ever. Uh, tell me, what are your thoughts this week on the state of what would otherwise have been uh, an ideologically driven season of uh, uh, endless political campaigning at this point? It seems remarkable to think that we are still in the midst of a presidential election campaign. Now, I say remarkable because at any other time that would no doubt have dominated our entire discussions and have been the focus for the American Chronicle as we make our way through an election year. That is simply the norm and uh, you would have expected, quite frankly, for all news to have focused entirely upon uh, the continuing democratic primaries which are continuing across the country uh, and the great question as to when and if Bernie Sanders is going to do the right thing and throw uh, the towel in and uh, throw his weight behind Joe Biden. That of course hasn't happened uh, instead of which we are continuing to focus quite naturally and quite rightly upon the national emergency which this nation finds itself in. And yet of course uh, those primaries, those elections, that process is still continuing. Uh, Joe Biden is still uh, out there campaigning uh, in one form or another uh, to secure the Democratic Party primary. At this point in time, uh, Bernie Sanders has simply refused to, uh, to throw the towel in. I think uh, many members of his team are recognising that really it is about time to do so. Um, nobody, I think, wants uh, a repeat of... 2016, when it's generally acknowledged, I think, that his continued candidacy uh, helped undermine uh, Hillary Clinton and uh, draw uh, the party further to the left and make it uh, more difficult, I think, for, for Hillary to win in uh, the general election against Donald Trump and also made it more complicated to unify the party at the conventions. The primaries this year are going to be very interesting, quite frankly, because, of course, uh, at this point in time, uh, such a convention would not be possible. Uh, whether when we meet the, uh, the back end of the summer such an event might be feasible is at this point uh, hopefully going to be the case, but we simply cannot tell. The Democrats have chosen to postpone their own convention, and that I think is all well and good. Uh, but at this point, of course, uh, we simply do not know uh, what those conventions are going to look like, whether they're going to be, need to be virtual, whether we will be able to have the kind of conventions which we're so used to seeing every four years with the accompanying razzmatazz uh, to nominate uh, two candidates uh, whose, whose names are already known almost certainly ahead of time, quite frankly. So the extent to which we might be able to forego those um, in terms of a physical gathering uh, will be interesting to see what transpires uh, a little later in the summer, quite frankly. Yes, uh Take us from the convention level to the individual level for a moment in regard to this week. We're hearing news of a possible Trump-Biden call uh, in a week in which the U.S., uh, as as we were talking before the show, is set to face its worst uh, COVID-19 numbers yet. Your thoughts on that potential call, please? Uh, the extent to which that is going to happen, I imagine, uh, is perhaps uh, uh, problematic uh, there was very little, I think, in the history of Donald Trump to suggest that he will really give an awful lot of attention to the views of his opponents and certainly even less 
likely to give any uh, any credence uh, to any op opponent's uh, perspectives. Certainly, uh, the track record of Donald Trump's career to date seems to suggest he has a propensity to put his finger in the air and try to sense where the political winds are blowing and to follow uh, that route to a certain extent and to make uh, gut decisions rather than decisions based upon um, uh, the advice of our experts and certainly not political opponents. So uh, Presumably there's, uh, as ever, more at play than uh, the personal reasons. What what in this case would be the uh, underlying systemic uh, blockages and otherwise that would uh, uh, distort and or prevent such a call? Um, the machinations behind the scenes and the political uh, movements which are occurring at this point are not unimportant for how it is that this national crisis is being addressed. And of course, we've seen that play out uh, in some of the legislation which is being passed. Uh, you're seeing, I think, in Washington, an extent to which this crisis is once more um, revealing the schisms between the two parties. We've seen the Republicans, I think, very much eager to try to uh, get this over and done with, to get Americans back to work and uh, lift these bans uh, where they are in place as quickly as possible uh, and where there is a bailout to seek uh, an initiative to bail out businesses. On the flip side of that, you have seen uh, Democrats, I think, perhaps more willing to um, engage and extend the, the lockdown uh, for fear of uh, exacerbating this situation. But also when there has been talk about issuing bailouts and uh, putting money on the table, looking very much, I think, to get that money directly to the American people uh, and also to uh, get attached to uh, this legislation, long-standing uh, democratic aspirations in terms of national policy. So uh, it will be interesting to see how this plays out. Uh, there is talk about uh, more bills going uh, through Congress uh, to increase public expenditure. Uh, we're already seeing eye-watering amounts being spent uh, in an attempt to reinforce the national economy. Uh, there's talk about infrastructure legislation going forward. Uh, you would have thought that would be one key area that Democrats and the White House will be able to agree upon. But uh, guess what, folks? This is Washington, D.C. Uh, and quite frankly, at this point, anybody knows. An unknowingly good segue there, James, to my final question tonight. Uh, as ever, uh, based along the lines of historical context, my favourite part of the show. Uh, and this week, I'm thinking about Joe Biden as uh, an old-fashioned Washington kind of candidate, having read several articles uh, on him this week, I was reminded of some words in his eulogy for his friend, the Republican senator, uh, the late John McCain, wherein Biden emphasized that uh, back in the day, as it were, uh, party politics didn't matter, only the underlying values that animated everything John did. Politicians were viewed as opponents and not enemies. Uh, could you talk to the point uh, that Washington, in, in its old-fashioned sense, may or may not have been seen as a uh, bastion of friendships and personal calculations back then, rather than of strict uh, ideological upholding of party lines, and uh, maybe talk a little on the, uh, the political spirit of Washington uh, that uh, Joe Biden would have enjoyed or, or endured or otherwise coming up. Uh, what was the, uh, the swamp spirit that, that uh, Trump spoke of uh, draining and or drowning? And uh, what is uh, Donald Trump's version of Washington spirit now? Politics is a strange beast. There's no doubt about it. And I think that unless you have been intimately involved with it, if you've run for office, held office... Uh, and seen some of the political machinations that go on behind the scenes. It's um, understandable why, if you've not done that, uh, politics and politicians might appear uh, simply to be at one another's throats all the time, all day, every day. Um, as someone who has been fortunate enough to have held public office in the United Kingdom and to have worked on Capitol Hill here in the United States and to have been afforded a, you know, a brief glance behind the curtain as to what transpires when the TV cameras are off. I can tell you that uh, usually um, the relationships between politicians of 
differing political parties is uh, very, very different than it might appear uh, on camera. Uh, politics is about theatre to a certain extent, and uh, most politicians, when they go before the TV cameras and uh, radio microphones, are perhaps understandably eager to draw sharp distinctions between themselves and their political opponents, uh, to present themselves as uh, all uh, all good and their op- their opponents as uh, as all bad. But of course, uh, once those uh, TV lights and the microphones are switched off, they have to deal with their political opponents. Uh, or nothing gets done. And indeed, uh, all too often, the great um, rivalries which are instigated and the uh, the heat uh, of distinctions between political camps are actually originated um, not by the politicians themselves, but by their rank-and-file members and the uh, the individuals who go door-to-door to whom this is a, a matter of passion. Uh, to those political professionals uh, who have held office and who are holding office, uh, be that uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, in the United States, in the Senate or in the House or in uh, uh, various uh, institutions around the country. Uh, All too often, those professional politicians are actually uh, far more uh, agreeable amongst one another than you might imagine. Um, We've seen, for example, cross-party friendships which have emerged in the past which have meant that legislation has been able to get through, which is driven by partisan uh, political uh, deals, for example. Uh, we saw individuals like John McCain notably being able to reach across the border and, uh, and make political machinations. Edward Kennedy, for example, um, did the same. Uh, it's notable, of course, that neither of those senators are with us anymore. Um, and we are perhaps in a, um, a different time. Uh, one of the great challenges which the Trump administration has brought to Washington, D.C. is that it has made uh, political bipartisanship far more complicated and difficult. Uh, politicians have long uh, had uh, caustic comments for their opponents, but they tend to be forgotten once uh, we're behind closed doors. Donald Trump, I think, has taken political rivalry and political name-calling to a whole new low, quite frankly, and made it much more complicated for politicians to forgive and forget uh, behind closed doors. Now, he is not uh, unique in this in terms of making um, a bipartisan agreement difficult. Uh, I was certainly very critical of some of the approaches which President Obama took when he was uh, in the White House and the way that he embraced what I thought of as a, a megaphone diplomacy uh, of speaking harshly about his political opponents, who, it must be said, of course, were very harsh and critical about himself. But I think it was notable that when you saw uh, political strides being taken during the Obama administration, it was all too often because of the work of the vice president, Joe Biden, who would work behind the scenes, uh, appear less before the cameras, uh, allow his boss, the president, to lambast his opponents on camera whilst he was quietly and diligently working behind the scenes, um, behind closed doors all too often, to try to make sure that deals were struck uh, and that you could get a sense of bipartisanship because uh, it is the only way uh, that legislation can pass here in the United States and politicians can talk and shout and uh, scream and uh, stomp their feet. But if they're not prepared to uh, recognise that politics is the the art of compromise, uh, that uh, to get you must give, uh, then nothing will ever pass. And indeed, I think if there has been a, a real challenge over the course of the last uh, eight, ten years, it is the fact that there has been a growing sense uh, by uh, groups on the the left and the right of American politics Um, including the Tea Party movement, which, of course, emerged uh, in the early days of the Obama administration and uh, what might be thought of as the more radical left uh, uh, here in the modern era in the Democratic Party, uh, that neither party believes in compromise, that they both believe in a sense of uh, indignation and a sense of uh, political purity. Uh, And this is making life very, very, very difficult uh, to govern, you need to govern from the centre. Legislation needs to have general agreement. Um, legislation here in the United States, 
uh, depending upon what it involves, either requires a straight majority or in many cases uh, a supermajority. Trying to get a supermajority uh, in the United States Senate where you need a two-thirds majority of uh, 100 senators to agree to anything is a very, very difficult prospect. And it is in these times, of course, that you need to have a common ground approach to politics. We need what might be thought of as old school politicians who can recognize that, yes, there is the rough and the tumble and the political aspects which take place in the full glare of the TV lights, but uh, who recognize also that there is the reality of politics which takes place behind closed doors in which these people uh, can find common ground and common purpose and that uh, no side will emerge totally victorious uh, and that uh, compromise uh, may well be a dirty word uh, in some circles, but it is also uh, the lubricant uh, which allows for politics to move forward. And without it, uh, as we have seen uh, all too often, I think, in recent years, quite frankly, nothing gets done. And as long as nothing gets done, uh, the American people will continue to look aghast, I think, at Washington, D.C. in a time of national crisis, scratch their heads and wonder what on earth it is uh, that these politicians are doing supposedly in their name. Until next Monday, then, this has been The American Chronicle with music by Chris Warner. I'm Michael L. Roberts. Follow Dr. James D. Boys on the links below. Tune in Thursday to the Voicing the World Late Night Noisecast. Good luck and ever onward to you all.